brutally hot day in July of 1919. A young teenager drowns in the waters of Lake Michigan. Not because he was a poor swimmer or a strong riptide or a heavy current, but simply because he was black. That young teenager's name was Eugene Williams. You're going to learn more about him this evening than you ever had before. Because tonight, we're going to talk about the race riots of 1919, known as the Red Summer. Now, on behalf of the Board of Trustees, our President Gary Johnson, and the staff here, I would like to welcome you all out to the Chicago History Museum. My name is Charles Bethay, and I am the Andrew W. Mellon Director of Collections and Curatorial Affairs. Long title, just means you blame me if something goes wrong. <laughs> so, without taking up further much of your time, I would like to thank our partners in this year-long endeavor, including the Newberry Library, and 12 other organizations that are on the back of your programs that have joined together to tell this story and commemorate and honor the lives lost and the events that took place in 1919. Now to help me do this this evening is one of my partners in crime and my colleague, distinguished colleague here, the Elizabeth F. Cheney Director of Education Nancy Villafranca. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Charles, thank you so much for the kind uh, introduction and really for um, the introduction that sets the tone, I think, uh, for the conversation that we are going to uh, have tonight. Um, as you already know, and as uh, Charles mentioned, uh, today's program is actually the second to last program um, of the larger Chicago 1919 Confronting the Race Riot series. This is a year-long initiative organized by the Newberry Library and many of its collaborators, uh, including the Chicago History Museum. And the goal of this initiative uh, is to heighten the 1919 uh, Chicago race riots in the city's uh, collective memory. And today's program specifically focuses on the topic of policing and racial violence from 1919 through today. And joining us today for this dynamic conversation are our three panelists. I will share a brief introduction of each of them, but I also invite you to learn more about them and their work through the biographies that you will find in the program notes we shared with you. To start, um, I would like to uh, introduce uh, Andy Clarno here to my left. Uh, Andy is an associate professor of sociology and African American studies at the University of Illinois at Chicago. In addition to teaching, Andy is the coordinator of the Policing and Chicago Research Group at UIC, uh, which has released three reports on the Chicago Police Department's uh, gang database. Then right next to Andy, we have Simon Balto, he is an assistant professor of history at the University of Iowa, where he teaches, researches, and writes about African American history in the United States. He's also the author of Occupied Territory, Policing Black Chicago from Red Summer to Black Power, which will serve as the basis of our conversation tonight. And then thirdly, we have Robin Robinson. Many of us uh, know her for our, and her work. Uh, as a journalist and longtime news anchor for Chicago Fox News. She is currently the director of restorative justice strategies at the Chicago Police Department, which she joined a few years ago, <laughs> and where she hopes to foster partnerships um, and relationships between the Chicago Police Department and its many neighborhoods and communities. So let's all welcome our panelists. We will now I would like to kick us off by sharing a phrase from Simon's book, 
that helped me center the larger impact and the legacy of the 1919 race riots. The 1919 race riot is a cornerstone in Chicago history. It seared the city, leaving psychic scars that lingered in black Chicago's collective consciousness for generations. And I would like to add that even if the history of the riots faded into the past for many, the impact is still with us today. Uh, we all know the current state of relations between the police department and many Chicagoans, particularly black and brown residents. It's not in a good place all the time. Um, and in your book, you explain that we can better understand the way things are today if we learn about what happened 100 years ago. So that's where we're going to start. We are going to start in 1919, where your book mm -hmm. begins. And you explain some of the context leading up to um, the riots, uh, and where you also clarify the relationship between police and black community, uh, the black community in Chicago. Um, I also want to just clarify, which you do in the book as well, that you intentionally focus on the black community and explored what a racialized policing system um, meant to them directly. And while we recognize that um, the study of uh, the impact of policing in other margin marginalized communities uh, is going to be beyond the scope of the book. And so the majority of our conversation will center on the relationship between the black community, community in Chicago and the police. Um, so let's just get started there, OK? okay? Um, you're going to probably have to do quite a bit of storytelling in some way <laughs> and share some of the background. But if you don't mind just kind of helping us understand what was that context like you know, leading up to 1919, um, and then just specifically, you know, in your research, what you discovered the role of police during that time and, and that kind of relationship. Yeah, sure, thank you. Um, and I guess before I answer that question, I, I just want to say a couple of things. First, thank you all for coming out on a, on a classically rainy Chicago evening. Um, second of all, um, you know, I think that we can perhaps broaden this conversation a little bit beyond um, black Chicago, particularly in the case of, you know, thinking about the gang database and things like that, which is obviously a, an issue that uh, vastly impacts uh, the Latino Latina community, um, and then thirdly, I just want to say that it's uh, it's great to be here because I kind of lived at the Chicago History Museum for a long time when I was writing my book or when I was researching my dissertation that eventually became my book. So, so it's it's good to be back. Um, so, by way of thinking about the context for 1919, um, I think it's important to understand that when Chicago explodes at the end of July in 1919. Um, it's in the midst of a years-long campaign of terrorism by white Chicago against black Chicago. Um, you know, that it, this is happening in the midst of the great migration of African Americans out of the South and into northern cities like Chicago. Um, and so from 1917 to 1921, there's a spate of dozens of bombings of black homes and businesses when black folks try to move into um, white neighborhoods. You know, that as black people are coming to the city, they need a place to live. And um, white Chicagoans, for a variety of reasons, don't want them living in white communities. And so you have this years-long campaign of violence against black people. Um, and the reason why that is relevant to this particular conversation about policing is that that campaign of violence goes essentially unpunished by the Chicago Police Department. Um, so over the span of four years with these, these dozens of bombings, um, there's one arrest made in total. Um, black activist groups in Chicago um, essentially begin discussing taking the law into their own hands and trying to launch their own investigations of these campaigns of violence um, because the police department won't do its job in terms of protecting black life and black property. Um, when 1919 does explode, when, when um, the city collapses into violence that sees 38 people killed, um, the police have a very um, important role in how that unfolds. Um, and for sake of brevity, I'll just, I'll just highlight a couple. Um, first of all, while I think it's perhaps overstating the case to say that um, the Red Summer doesn't happen without the inaction of a uh, Chicago police officer by the name of Daniel Callahan, who is a proud racist. Um, even his own superiors within the Chicago Police Department blamed him for what happened. Um, so when 
Um, and to, to, rep, to, to call back Charles's introduction to the program, when um, Eugene Williams is murdered um, as he's floating on a raft um, off the 29th Street beach, people who are in the area have seen who is throwing the rocks that ultimately led him to die. Um, so people are throwing stones at this raft of Eugene Williams and these other black boys, and this is ultimately what causes Eugene Williams to drown. Um, so when people call for the arrest of this man who had, been throwing the, who had initiated the rock throwing, um, they approach a white police officer who's stationed at the beach, Daniel Callahan, and Daniel Callahan refuses to arrest the killer. Um, and then in turn, as people who are, as black members um, of the community who are, you know, approaching Daniel Callahan to demand this arrest, as they are doing these things, uh, as they're demanding the arrest, Daniel Callahan gets increasingly upset and then he uh, arrests one of the black men demanding the arrest of, of the white killer. Um, and this is really the initiation point for the riot. Um, it's an initiation point that is defined by a police officer who is uh, explicitly refusing to, to value black life. Um, and, you know, Daniel Callahan is suspended from the force for a while, and then he's eventually reinstated. And um, after he's reinstated, he's interviewed by the Chicago, or by the Riot Commission that studies what happened in 1919. And he basically says that if something like this happens again, he'll proudly be a member of the white side of a race war once again. And thinking through that singular lens on Daniel Callahan, I think, in some ways, um, illustrates further um, defining features of what happened in 1919. Um, and by that, I mean that when the Red Summer Riot explodes, the approach of the police force is to send 80% of its force down to the south side where the vast majority of black Chicago was confined at that time. Um, and to essentially establish a perimeter around, black, around the black section of Chicago um, with, I think, for, I think, the noble intentions of, of trying to essentially prevent these white gangs that were provoking most of the violence from entering into the black community. However, what that meant was that black people um, were oftentimes subject to extraordinary violence when they were on their way to work, when they were outside of that part of town. And the other thing that it meant was that black people were vastly, vastly overrepresented when it came to actually making arrests during the riot. So this is a riot that is defined primarily by white violence and black armed self-defense. Um, that the main proponents of violence were white gangs, including one um, of which future Mayor Richard Daley was a member, um, essentially marauding through black Chicago and beating and killing people. And so black people take up arms in self-defense. Um, and when black people take up arms in self-defense, they're the ones that are arrested. So although the numbers of people who die in the riot are essentially two to one, black to white, the inverse is true when it comes to the arrest rates. So that vastly more black folks than white folks were arrested by the Chicago Police Department during this moment. Um, and it gets to such a ridiculous and extreme degree that when a post-riot grand jury is convened to hold trials for people who are brought up on riot charges, they go on strike because they are so aghast at the extreme racial disproportion that the Chicago Police Department has, um, has done in terms of how it's chosen to arrest people and bring them up on charges. Um, and so the reason that I begin the book there, in addition to thinking that 1919 is a defining moment in the city's history that continues to be vastly misunderstood or vastly ignored, is that when we think about some of the problems that plague black Chicago today, um, and I say this as, as someone who cares deeply about, uh, about Chicago and about black Chicago, even though I don't get to live here anymore, um, is that you know, when we think about black Chicagoans as being both subject to increased and disproportionate levels of harassment and violence and surveillance um, from the CPD. Um, by the same token, black communities are also um, overrepresented in terms of communities that are most subject to um, intracommunal violence um, and you know, other forms of, of structural and physical violence. 
Um, and so when we think about those two issues as being defining problems when it comes to the black community's relationship to the CPD in 2019, those things are already evident and emergent in 1919. Mm -hmm. And uh, obviously the scale and the magnitude of the riot was fairly unique, right? But I think also what you explain in your book is that those types of interactions were actually quite typical. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we obviously we understand that that relationships is, is already um, sort of already t tilted and, and biased at that time. Um, Robin, I wanted to uh, take this next question to, to you and just to ask you how, how is it that um, Simon's description of that perception and relationship between the police and the African American community uh, either resonates or compares uh, with your covering um, of police uh, and racial violence as a, as a journalist, which you spent 27 years uh, doing um, <laughs> as a career here in Chicago. So I was curious you know, to hear from you uh, and also from that perspective about those kinds of stories that you covered and what you took to mean, uh, describe that uh, relationship to be. So my, um, my history of storytelling uh, is really rooted in my father, who was a, a writer for Ebony for 27 years, and his basic mission premise was show black excellence, kind of prove that we are 100% human, as you know, because when you talk about CPD or police not valuing black life, America was not valuing black life, mm -hmm. and, there, and to expect one structure, which is particularly problematic even for people that aren't black, right, law enforcement, to somehow be better than the rest of, of the people who are, have bought into this lie, which was told in order to justify a crime against humanity. Um, so I focus a lot of my reporting on kind of what I call, I didn't call it that at the time, but it's like restorative narrative, you know, kind of, you know, look at this great thing going on, or here's a problem, but here's a solution. Here's people doing something great. But police, stories about police acting badly, particularly to African Americans, that's low hanging fruit. I mean, it, what was, and, and the problem earlier in my career was it was all anecdotal. And you know, I would say, you, you think everybody's just lying? And then came the cell phone, right? So it's suddenly, oh, maybe it is happening. Um, but there are, whole, black people have never in this country to this day been able to take for granted the equal protection of law. At the, it, okay, I mean, ever. Which is not to say that they're always, they always don't get it, right? But you can't take it for granted. You don't, you, you don't, mm -hmm. you don't have that benefit of the doubt. You know, conversely, some of the most uh, transformational victories have had to go through the courts and not, not through the populace. Um, so that has kind of been why, it's, why, you know, black lawyers and places like the Southern Poverty Law Center that focus on, you know, having relief from the American justice system until people figured out all they had to do was appoint the right judges, but that's another story. Um, so, you know, I've, re I've reported on, I don't, know, I don't even know how I got this on the air, uh, and, and I've run into the lawyer who represented the woman previously, uh, now in my current job, and he was a young lawyer, then a, a woman who was, a, who was what I now call a trafficked person, um, and she was in the, the, the uh, high rises down there, Robert Taylor Homes, and an officer who was a detective was forcing her to, to um, you know, engage in sex um, so as not to arrest her. And she actually saved some evidence, I won't tell you how. Went to the hospital, had it tested, matched him, got a lawyer, was, was suing, and I did the story. It was very difficult to do, was, but the only reason we could do it was because it wasn't just her word against his, because her word meant nothing. Because a police officer's word is supposed to mean something, right? Um, yet you find out that black people aren't the only ones who know that it, it doesn't always. Right? So I remember talking to Dick Devine, the former uh, state's attorney here in Chicago for many years, who said, you have to bring me more than the cop said for me to, for me to file charges. And I thought, wow, you don't, you, you, you don't trust them either. And it only takes a few instances mm -hmm. of, of seeing you know, just how bad they can be, but it doesn't matter if they're individuals. And you talk about looking at it through Callahan's mm -hmm. eyes, right? Um, I mean, not only did they not arrest the the, the, the people that were throwing the rocks, but the people that were throwing rocks weren't just throwing rocks. When other black people came to try to, who could swim, were gonna go to try to save them, they kept them from going into that water because it was not their part of the water. Um, but it was reflecting, 
um, he said they didn't want them to move into their neighborhoods for a variety of reasons. It was for the American reason. It was for, it was because people had been told, taught, convinced, brainwashed, benefited from the idea that people from Africa were less than human. And so that whole narrative of fear, hate, permeated everything. Um, I, I, sometimes I think that it's a miracle, <laughs> okay? I might just be a miracle sitting here, right? I mean, the, from what we, you know, really had to, and, I, and, and it's, the worst part of it is that, that some of it was internalized. So if you say, you know, going back 100 years can help us going forward, I wanna go back further than 100 years. And I always go there. I'm gonna go back 400 years. It's so 1919. Go to 1619. This is a, this is an auspicious year. This 2019. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, there's a there's uh, it just, yeah. but it's you know, it's the original sin. Thank you, uh, Robin. And so, you know, you obviously you covered all of this, and you you lived and experienced a lot of this throughout your career as a journalist. But not you're with the police department, and so I experienced it as a person as too, a person. right? Yes, yeah, <laughs> yes. Personally, so mm -hmm. you know, how do you channel that into the role that that you have now? Well, the same way that I respond to people that tell me, oh, that's a violent neighborhood, or oh, that's a bad neighborhood, because they're judging the whole neighborhood by, you know, a small percentage, and then they want to know, well, why doesn't the rest of the neighborhood, you know, address that and, and do something about it? It's a similar thing within policing, right? It's kind of life or death. Um, if we can shift the culture, and I see a lot of, I, I hate people get upset, I'm not being defensive. Some really good people work in the police department. Anybody here? And they don't always admit it when they're out in public, they are the police. Anybody got any police in here? Because I'm not the police. No? Nope. They're afraid to come here with you guys tonight. That's what happened. <laughs> um, but uh, there are some people get into it for a lot of very altruistic reasons. Of course, there are also those people that get into it because they were bullied. They want to be a bully, right? So the, the, the psychological profile of why someone wants to be in law enforcement. But you would hope that it would attract some really good people. That would be the hope, right? So it's made me, uh, it's given me relationships that I wouldn't have otherwise had because they, um, people in law enforcement don't tend to go around saying, yes, I'm the police, would you like to talk to me about my job? Because a lot of times the conversation's very difficult. Um, it's a hard time to be a police officer. Uh, I don't know if there ever is an easy time, but <laughs> particularly now, when, with all your warts exposed, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, and why, ha why have you not done something about it? And so I think that there, the, what it's given me is a little more hope because I've seen a, there are, for the most part, really good people, for the most part, a really bad system. It's institutionally um, kind of almost designed to, uh, to not be hum human-centered. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, are, we, have a, we have a punitive justice system, no matter that it hasn't uh, made us any safer, mm -hmm. right? Um, it, it, that's the way we're going. You know, we are addicted to punishment. And I'm, and I'm, and I'm glad that you brought that up because I think we're probably going to keep going back to the idea of, of the system, you know, throughout the, well, the structural the racism. Right. Yeah. Um, most definitely. Um, but Andy, before we even just move on, just go a little bit deeper there, I, I wanted to give you an opportunity to share um, a little bit about the work that you do with community groups and organizations and to sort of represent from your perspective and characterize that relationship um, as well, you know, between uh, police and some of, you know, the systematic uh, yeah. or just practices uh, and some of the people that you work with. Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks everyone for being here and for having us here for this conversation. So. Uh, I'm on the faculty at UIC. I'm also the coordinator of the Policing in Chicago Research Group. The Policing in Chicago Research Group is a, is a research team of graduate students and faculty at UIC that does research on policing in conversation with local community organizations and social movements. Uh, obviously, communities, black, Latinx, Arab, and Muslim communities in Chicago have a lot of concerns and, and distrust of of not only the Chicago Police Department, but other law enforcement agencies as well, ICE, the FBI, right? So concerns about the, obviously the, the, the disproportionate incarceration and death of black youth, immigration raids and deportation of immigrant communities of color, particularly the Latinx communities, and then the surveillance and infiltration of Arab and Muslim communities. Uh, creates a basis for a lot of fear and distrust that, that is systemic, mm -hmm. right? 
Uh, the, the organizations that we've been working with, we, we, we provide research support to organizations that have, are trying to understand policing and how it operates. And one of the, some of the questions that have really driven our work over the last couple of years have had to do with big data and data-driven policing. It wasn't necessarily articulated that way at the beginning, but um, communities came to us with concerns, organizations came to us with concerns about the gang databases. They knew that the police department, the CPD, maintains a gang databases, gang designations, and uses that to target black and brown youth, and that ICE has access to this information somehow and uses it as a pipeline to deportation for immigrants. <coughs> Uh, to target them as priority targets for, for mm -hmm. deportation. There were also concerns on the part of Arab and Muslim communities about relationships between the police department and the FBI for surveillance, counterterrorism and surveillance, and what are the structures that are in place to facilitate coordination and data sharing between the local police and the federal, uh, the FBI. And so this is what we spent the last couple of years looking into. A lot of our work is really focused on the gang databases, um, mm -hmm. but, but What's become clear is that in this current era of policing, it's the, it's, there's something about big databases, right? The collection of massive amounts of information and the way it gets stored and used uh, through, the, through advanced algorithm, algorithms to predict who, when, and where crime is gonna take place. And then the way it also gets shared between different law enforcement agencies that facilitates the coordination between local police, federal immigration authorities, and homeland security agencies, which you know, use this information to target communities of color across the city. Mm -hmm. and, and community organizations like, uh, across the city have, have really built some powerful coalitions to push back against these forms of policing and to call into question not only right, the, the spectacular forms of violence that we see when a person is killed, <coughs> but the everyday forms of policing that, mm -hmm. that take place in communities of color and to understand what, how this works and to resist and push mm -hmm. back against it. Yeah, um, and I'm recalling, uh, Simon, in your book, um, you also make mention that a lot of the practices or sort of the state of things today were put in place you know, a long time ago and they're really yeah. only a fairly new types of um, strategies and practices and one of them is you know, data-driven yeah. uh, uh, policing, but if you don't mind, uh, Simon, just summarizing, you know, perhaps what are some of the other practices that we saw then, you know, 100 mm -hmm. years ago, but we kind of continue to see today. I mean, in some ways you touched on it, um, but I think um, it's just kind of important to remember that, you know, they, these are sometimes happening even at the same time, mm -hmm. right, um, when there's um, incidents today. but. Uh, and in addition to that, if you don't mind saying a little bit more about those practices, and also when you um, also describe that it hit a, a low point um, mm -hmm. in the 1960s. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the, I, th I think that there's a little bit of a misperception about the newness of a lot of the, the, the problems that we as, as communities of color face vis-a-vis uh, -vis the police. Um, and so part of what I was trying to do with the book, I mean, I, I, a lot of the narrative about where these, you know, where problems of, you know, stop and frisk and, you know, saturating communities of color with, with police and so on and so forth, um, there seems to be a, a misperception that those things originated with the war on drugs, um, which isn't really true. Um, and it's especially not true in Chicago. And so um, when, I, when I was constructing this book, I mean, I basically ended the 1970s in the aftermath of the CPD and FBI's murder of Fred Hampton um, because I, I think when you look at that moment in time at the end of the 1960s, you know, I mean, things like stop and frisk are running rampant and roughshod throughout uh, black communities in Chicago. Um, the CPD is using, um, is explicitly measuring officer efficiency by the number of stops that they make when it comes to policing black communities. Um, it's basically become impossible almost to be arrested while white in Chicago. Um, you know, things like, I mean, and, and you know, when we, th when we think about the, the um, murders of Fred Hampton and Mark Clark on December 4th, 1969, um, those are only two of literally dozens and dozens and dozens of police killings of unarmed 
um, <coughs> black men and women that happened over the course of, uh, of the late 1960s. Um, and, you know, I mean, it's, it's arguably, I think, actually a more violent time period than our current one in terms of thinking about police, uh, police killings of, of black men and women. And so um, I, I think that when we're thinking about this system as a system, um, and, and I want to be very clear that, like, you know, I mean, we can see, through, see things through the eyes of someone like Daniel Callahan in 1919 and perceive him as a quote-unquote bad apple. And I agree that there are, I mean, I absolutely agree that there are plenty of people who get into law enforcement with the best of intentions. I gave a talk at the CPL, um, Harold Washington Library, earlier this summer where I actually had a long conversation with a, a, a brilliant and beautiful young man who was, uh, who was in the police academy. And he was in it for the best of intentions, but he was, he was reading my book to try to figure out like, mm. how, to, how to do something about it, right? I mean, and so, and so he asked Can me Can you give me his name? Make sure he moves up the ranks. I, I, gave, I gave him my card, but he, uh, he, he hasn't emailed me. But, um, but the point being, I mean, that, you know, that, that there, you know, I, I have a problem with the, with the bad apples framework because there are, there are bad apples and there are absolutely wonderful apples, but like, you know, the apple barrel is, is, is a problem, right? I mean, and so, and so um, you know, when we think about the problems that we face in 2019, the problems that we, you know, the problems that black communities were, were beginning to face in 1919, and I don't want to say that, like, what, I don't want to say policing in Chicago in 1919 looked the same as it does in 2019, because that's not true, right? I mean, that, mm -hmm. that these systems evolve. I mean, that in 1919, black folks in Chicago are not mm -hmm. the primary problem in the eyes of, in the eyes of the CPD, that they're still in a lot of ways concerned at that point in time with um, labor radicals, European immigrants, and so on and so forth, but they're evolving their perception mm -hmm. of black folks. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And so thinking about how, those, how these systems become more powerful and increasingly repressive over time, I think is useful just in terms of making us better understand how deep the problems that we currently are dealing with really are rooted mm -hmm. um, in this system. And so when we look at like the 1960s, you know, I mean, things like big data, things like the militarization of police, where they're literally getting arm, getting weapons from the military. Mm -hmm. um, those are new developments. But in terms yeah. of these larger sort of day-to-day mm -hmm. -day operations of how policing works on the ground and how people experience mm -hmm. being policed, um, in a lot of ways, you know, that stuff has been entrenched for a long time. Yeah, I think that's an important um, clarification. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, Andy, if you don't mind, I'll follow up with you just to ask a little bit more about. How does then, in more recent decades, um, how does the dynamics change of, of policing with data-driven uh, practices? Yeah, I, I think in, in many ways it's an expansion. Uh, as Simon makes clear in the book, uh, many of these practices are rooted in things that were, hap that, that were happening before the 1960s and it expanded during the 1960s. So in many ways, the, the Red Squad, which operated in Chicago for many years and collected files on hundreds of thousands of individuals and, and organizations, they, that's the pre, the, that kind of file system is the precursor to contemporary gang databases and terrorist watch lists, right? The, when Orlando Wilson introduced this kind of professionalization of the policing to move it away from the police as a tool of local ward bosses and to try to create a professional modern police force, one of the points that Simon's book makes so powerfully is that this looked really good mm. for the police department. And it was terrible for black Chicago, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? Because the police started you know, using data and pr promoting stops and frisks to, to, to target you know, what they perceived with, with the limited amounts of data that they had at that time as hotspots, right? Mm -hmm. in, the, in, the, in the 1990s, though, uh, m most people think about big data policing as, as or, or data-driven or intelligence-led policing as a development that took place after September 11, yeah. after those attacks. But it was really grounded here in Chicago by the, by the middle of the 1990s. The CPD introduced community policing caps and data-driven policing. They, were ha they went hand-in-hand hand mm -hmm. from the very beginning. One of the things that sets Chicago's community policing project apart from several other cities is the real emphasis on data analysis, data collection and analysis. And by the early 2000s, in, in 2001, the CPD began, well, had been working with the Oracle Corporation for many years, but they began developing a new data system called CLEAR, 
the citizen and law enforcement analysis and reporting system. This is the overall database that the CPD uses, right? All kinds of things go into that. Uh, you know, 911 calls, witness statements, arrest records, include mugshots, tattoos, including information about people who don't have arrests but ha are, whose activities are considered suspicious by the police. So one of the databases is of investigatory stop reports. They used to be called contact cards, right? When people are stopped and searched, they, they put that data into a database. Not only data about, who, about yourself, but about who you were with, mm -hmm. right? And use that to develop analyses of people's social networks and who they know and who they're connected to. A lot of the, the, the advanced electronic surveillance also kind of flows into these kinds of databases. And then it gets used through predictive algorithms, advanced predictive algorithms, to identify hot spots or hot people, right? There's a, the strategic subjects list has recently changed names, but the algorithm is not much different to try to identify people who are likely to be what the police department referred to as a party to violence and, and to target them for special interventions. So, so the, the, all of this data which is collected and stored in these databases is then used to shape deployments. And I think that one of the things that for me stands out in, in in Simon's book, there was a, a number. He says that by the early 1970s, the, the, black to, the, the ratio of black to white arrests on the part of the CPD, they were arresting two to three times more black people than white people by the early 1970s. And that stayed consistent until the late 1990s when the ratio jumped to seven to one, mm -hmm. and at which point the CPD basically stopped arresting white mm -hmm. people, right? Mm -hmm. and I, I think we have to ask ourselves, is that a coincidence that at the time when they're starting to really ramp up the collection and use of data to identify where to police and how to deploy officers, mm -hmm. is it coincidental that this is the time when there, you see this, this, this jump mm -hmm. in black arrests? Mm -hmm. Because the data that they're using is data based on police arrests and police stops, mm -hmm. right? And so you use that data to say who where is crime happening and who are the people we need to be watching, you're using the data that's already yeah. biased and racialized and it pro provides like a, a feedback loop yeah. and, and therefore like a, a mathematical justification that looks neutral and objective and scientific mm -hmm. on paper because it's driven by right. data and, yeah. and algorithms, but, yeah, no, but I, in I, practice, I what does it do? What you're saying there and actually as I'm hearing you, I'm thinking about, well, I wanted to ask how to how does the presence of police in schools, which we know is very prominent, sort of relate to all of this, including the collection of data? Um, we know that police officers are placed in about 100 schools. And, 72. And 72. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Updated statistics. 72 and they're schools. not placed there. They're requested. They're requested. Right. We would uh, rather not be. They would mm -hmm. rather not be there. <laughs> and we know that the Chicago public school body, you know, is composed of 85% African American, Latinx uh, young people. Mm -hmm. So we know it's a it's a really full majority. So I'm just wondering how that also kind of factors in um, into the the policing strategies. So it's not a policing strategy mm -hmm. to, to have school resource officers. Mm -hmm. And I'll be the first to admit that until this year, we didn't have school resource officers. We just had cops in schools. So there is a particular skill set, criteria selection, you're not to be involved in discipline. We've all seen the ridiculous videos of you know, things happening. You're like, why is that? And there's a variety of reasons. A lot of times, people in the schools may not quite understand what the role of the officer is there for. Um, you know, it's not to be involved in discipline issues. You know, don't call them when the kid won't give up their cell phone. That's not, that's not a criminal act. So getting that right or thinking about why, what kind of climate would require you to want an officer in a school, right? So how do, you, how do you fix that? And if you fix that, is the school then the only safe oasis in a neighborhood? Mm. Why, why is it that's the targeted neighborhood? So it's the condition that you've created that justifies a response that then feeds that condition further, right? You talk about uh, disproportionate incarceration is absolute, it's like targeted incarceration. It's, you know, we say mass incar incarceration, but it's concentrated incarceration. It's, you know, 80% mm -hmm. of Cook County Jail is African American. Yeah. Yeah. 70 to 80 percent of the people who are accused of or victims of violent crime are African American. 
this is a bigger problem yeah. uh, than just, and then communities where the condition has led to a lot of harmful behavior, they're clamoring for more police, right? Mm -hmm. So then the you get more police, you get more police, you're gonna get more arrests, right? You know, if there's, because I'm sure that they're missing a lot of stuff in some really nice neighborhoods up here, okay? Because they just, because they're just not here in those numbers. So, you know, yeah. people have a little more freedom to fail. Um, but I just, I, I want to warn against, you know, what I call it the danger of the single story. Mm -hmm. So this, if, you, yeah. if you singularly focus on, I mean, databases can be problematic entirely. There are some people who are um, advocates uh, for, um, for better handling of, 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 you know, stopping sexual assault, stopping sex trafficking, who think that the, the um, sexual uh, predator or sexual, whatever they call it, the registry, the people that have ever been convicted have to register everywhere where they live, et cetera. They don't think it works. They think it leads to at least one organization case, which is pretty prominent, says it leads to a false sense of security. Oh, we think you know where everybody is, but in fact you don't. And in fact you have some people who are on there who shouldn't be. And you spend a lot of money um, systemizing, you know, keeping this registry up when you could be spending it on victim services, mm -hmm. prevention, education, treatment, et cetera. Um, so I, I agree that big data, we sometimes just get, we just, like it, and in my work, you know, it's always like, well, how do we know? You know, how do we know there's proof of performance? I'm like, I don't know how you measure a relationship, and put it into your spreadsheet. Um, but I do know that it's the basis mm -hmm. of anything good that's going to happen. Yeah, and I, and do you want to say something? Just, Simon? just yeah. really quick, because um, I think that this question of like the relationship between policing and schools is important beyond even the beyond even the question of like police in schools. Um, I don't know how many, I don't know, I don't know the degree to which Chicagoans appreciate how much, I don't pay taxes here anymore, so I, I'd say you. Um, I don't know if you appreciate how much you, you all spend on police. You spend $1.5 billion every single year on the CPD. Um, and to me, in a city that is closing schools, is extracting nurses and social workers from schools, that is an abomination. Um, and so, so, so thinking through thinking through budgetary priorities, um, you know, again, thinking about you know if we redirect some of those resources towards things that I mean, and the CTU is about to go on strike over these issues, right? Um, you know, about like getting nurses and social workers in schools, addressing the fact that seventeen thousand children in seventeen thousand children go to school but don't have a home. You know, I mean, thinking about how, how the city as an entire ecosystem addresses issues of, I mean, to these questions of just mm -hmm. absolutely reprehensible levels of racialized, racist inequality that stretches way beyond the police department, right? I mean, like, thinking about this as an entire, as an entire worldview, um, I think would actually perhaps get us somewhere towards a better and more equitable place um, and part of it, for me at least, means stripping a hell of a lot of money aw away from the mm -hmm. police budget and reinvesting it into social infrastructure. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And, um, I'm, I'm going to follow up on, on your point and suggestion about redirecting resources to sort of move, move us into reform and change and having some of those conversations. Our hour is slipping uh, minute by, by minute. Um, but um, obviously that's one of the more popular you know, suggestions about um, where to place uh, the money um, because right now it just it seems to go on punitive um, you know, uh, from that perspective. And so um, Robin, I, I wanted to just follow up with you a little bit more so you can share more about a concept you had uh, shared in our conversation last week about just the police department being in constant state of reform, but also just to learn more about, you know, what is guiding, uh, you know, the Chicago Police Department. What are the changes that that you sort of personally are involved with, um, knowing what we know about the impact, right? Um, that really a lot of this history and a lot of this concentration really impacts Black and Brown communities and other marginalized communities. Um, what does that work look like right now for a CTD? So you talked about kind of a, a holistic view, mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's very hard for people to do, right? We focus on whatever's on fire in the corner, right? And, and it becomes front and center. That's what reporters do for the most part. No matter that they have then skewed the entire full view, you think everything that's happening is that fire. Um, but I think that I have a lot of friends who are police abolitionists. 
and they make the very same argument. And I believe, too, that we should ab abolish policing as it has been conducted in this country. All right? <laughs> but, I also, but I also believe that um, there's an inherent danger in the field of law enforcement. So we keep talking about the Chicago police, and I, I want to broaden out not just to law enforcement, but to all of us, that we all exist in a state of racial anxiety um, in this country because of, the, because of the persistently racist structures that started a long time ago, and they're very difficult to even talk about. That's where the anxiety comes in, right? Um, you know, it's like, you know, well, you know I, that wasn't me, that wasn't I have no, I'm going to have no privilege, you know, and whatever, it, whatever the conversations, you know, boil down to, we realize that of all those people that were experiencing uh, biased policing back in 1919, I mean, if you look, I just want, this, uh, this blew my mind, which is that they listed the nativity of people arrested in the whole year, not just for, not just for during the riots. Um, and really the people that fared uh, the worst after quote unquote colored were Polish, Italian, something they called, well, and this wasn't, their numbers weren't big, but I was just amazed, they called them Bohemian. Um, and they listed it by um, Russian, and it could have had to do with the numbers of Eastern European immigrants that were here. Um, but also you talked about the conditions, the migration from the South, but also you had black men who had been to war and, had, and were not gonna, not gonna take this lying down. For, so to me, one of the, biggest hallmarks of 1919 was for the first time stand, fighting back. Uh, and people actually talked about that, even for the loss of life and, and against the odds and what have you, fighting back. And the surrounding, the National Guard coming and kind of seeming, as you said, to protect the community, but that also resulted in more black people being arrested than anybody else. Um, but it reflected the times, right? Maybe they just didn't want the city to burn down and the, and the fire spread to everything. So there was a lot of loss of housing and buildings. Um, but it really, they, they was the, George Stauber, the, the rock throwing gang leader, actually was indicted. But he was found not guilty by the judge. So, I mean, it was, it, it reflected the absolutely racially polarized times. Today, mm -hmm. addressing that, actually learning how to talk about it, um, the fact that I never was taught about the Red Summer. In, in all of my education. I don't, I don't that's, that doesn't sound like an accident to me. That sounds like an intentional carving out of a piece of history that we don't like. Um, you know, I'm, and, and you look at the people that, we now have Fred Hampton way, and people act like, oh yeah, we always thought he was a hero. You did not, okay? So, you know, the, cha the changing, you know, I, I thought he was uh, killed in a shootout. Oh, an assassination now? Okay, you know, so we can't forget, you know, what, what things were just because we would like to think that they are okay now. Um, we come to this museum with recruits. Every recruit, in fact, we started out at the Dutzabel Museum. Every recruit for the last two and a half years, so almost 3,000 of them because we had a hiring surge, has come to a museum to learn about policing through the African-American lens, which is what does it meant to, to black people, right? And why do people not like you on site when you go in their neighborhoods? Um, how do you have a conversation about Blue Lives Matter being a, an insult to Black Lives Matter. How do you, how do you, I mean, how do you, so it's, you gotta change your policies and mm -hmm. procedures and structures mm -hmm. and all that. But at the end of the day, you have to empower people to remain part of their community and not become this separate force, which the professionalization, O.W. Wilson's big ideas did, said, you know, just, just the facts, ma'am, leave it to us, we'll take care of it. Well, you, they can't take care of it without community collaboration, trust, cooperation, a legitimacy, in the, stay within the community. Um, you know, officers clumping up and only being with other people in law enforcement because nobody understands us. Us not addressing the trauma that comes with what they do, right? Not just the bad things that some do, but what they actually see and address every day, officer wellness. Um, We've not had that kind of holistic, I'm not, and I'm not saying that's going to justify continuing to spend $1.6 billion on police, but what I'm saying is that you have, to, you have to fix a bunch of stuff all at once. If you just said, okay, we don't need any more police, there are places that are going to be very difficult to be in, all right? So let's, let's be realistic about that, but you don't want the kind of law enforcement that hasn't made us any safer.
Um, mm -hmm. You know, when we talk about a, a punitive system, it's a, the definition of insanity to keep doing the same thing and expecting a different result. So we're mm -hmm. trying to do things mm -hmm. pretty dramatically different, um, but it's not easy to shift culture. Mm -hmm. yeah. And as I said to you on the phone, right. it is a ne it'll be a never-ending vigilance. Um, you yeah. will always police. Uh, law enforcement is inherently um, <laughs> dangerous, not for the physical danger yeah. you're in, but for your, your psyche. Yeah. In my, if, in my very unlearned opinion, right? I've only been working for the police department for four years. I am not the police. Let's get that straight. Something happens in this room and you guys are in danger. Do not run behind me. I'm going to be running out the door, okay? So I'm not going to help. I can't help you. Right? Um, well, yes. <laughs> um, I, I agree. The cultural shift, obviously, is, is the hardest um, one, one to do. Uh, but just to kind of get us ready to wrap up and close and then open up to question and answer, uh, it's definitely very eerie how, you know, the death of Laquan McDonald just resembles the death of Eugene Williams so much, mm. just a hundred years apart, right? And uh, we know we do not want to be in the same place 100, um, you know, Except they didn't even try to cover it up because at the time it was socially acceptable. <laughs> yeah. And so, so I just wanted to get us uh, to wrap up, um, maybe perhaps looking a little bit more into the future um, and some of the opportunities um, that, we, that we have ahead of us. And just like I opened with a, just a little piece, an excerpt from your book, Simon, I was hoping that we can conclude our conversation that way uh, as well, because you, you mentioned in the closing of your book uh, that history um, is at work at, in the present now. And we have the opportunity to learn from this history. History is not just how we tend to the dead, but a vehicle for attending to the living, to look at the past and to the future as well. And you're right. It must force us to reckon not only with the history of the police arrangement in this, uh, in this country, but also with the reality of the one that we live with today. Maybe by reckoning, we can begin reimagining, and perhaps by reimagining, we can make the reality of the past and present not be the reality of the future. So we just have a few minutes left, but I, I hope that, um, that you maybe perhaps each take um, less than a minute or so to, to just talk about how we can use um, this as an opportunity to face this history and attend to the living today and reimagine a better future. Um, yeah, and I'll, pardon me, I'll, I'll be brief. Um, so, I mean, I don't, I'm not someone who's predisposed to having a lot of hope in this current system, having studied it for 10 years and having, having had my own experiences with racialized policing as well. Um, but I will say that there are moments in, time, in this history where I am fortified a little bit having studied people in the past who have, who have sought to challenge and reimagine this system. So. For example, in the early 1970s, in the aftermath of the murders of Red Hampton and Mark Clark, this huge network of community organizations in Chicago, spearheaded by the, the Black Panthers, but also the African American Patrolmen's League, indigenous groups, the uh, Latino Latina groups, um, poor white organizations, um, launched a campaign to get community control of the police, right? Which essentially, the fundamental question at the core of an effort for community control is, who are the police actually responsible, who, who, pardon me, who are the police responsive to, right? And who controls the police? Who gets a say in what policing looks like? Who, um, you know, what, what sort of democratic processes animate police behavior and police logics? And when they're asking that question in the 1970s, the answer essentially is that they don't know. I mean, they don't know really who the police system responds to who can control the police, and so they say, we'll control the police. And so what that looks like is essentially that neighborhoods um, have their own police boards where they get to determine and dictate what policing in that, in that neighborhood looks like. Um, and all of this is to say that, you know, we have creative thinkers in the past, in the, in, in the history of our city, who have been asking these questions for a very long time. And that is both, A, really frustrating because nothing has really changed for the better, um, for the most part. Um, but B, I think it is worth knowing that the questions that we are wrestling with right now have an ancestry. Um, and thinking about that ancestry and 
perhaps using some of those imaginings from the past um, going forward is, is, a, is a worthy project. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Uh, Robin or Andy, would you like to answer the question like I as said well? Enough. <laughs> We're almost out of time. But. No, you go. I mean, yeah, I would pick up on, on what Simon says and say, I, I feel like we're living in, in a moment like the, the, that those years of the early 1970s now, in the last four years in Chicago, there's been so many powerful mobilizations for establishing community control over the police to shift the way that funding happens with the campaign to, to, to stop the construction of a new police academy, to erase the gang database, to stop the practices of com countering violent extremism, and communities of color across the city are coming together in powerful coalitions and demanding a say in what policing looks like and, and what happens in their communities. And I think that that's where I place my hope mm -hmm. at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Robert. I would ask, would any of you send your young adults to be uh, members of law enforcement? So that's why you get what you get. We talk about control of the police as if they are not people, right? I mean, you want control, you want local control, and I believe that the, the, the best thing you can do is have the best people and, and give them the best framework, but even that is going to require constant vigilance, right? I've, if the Afro-American Patrol League could see the, what the executive level looks like at CPD now, their mind would be blown, right? I mean, because I, there was a lot of racism that Officers, face, officers of color face within the police department. Mm -hmm. I mean, you still don't have a whole lot of mixed teams. But um, I also try to recruit. I try to recruit black people to the police department. And it's very, very hard. If they can do something else, for the most part, they would rather do something else. So you, have, you, so you start with your human capital is the most valuable thing you have. And I don't know what kind of a what kind of um, control is going to change your outcome, right? Because you're dealing with people, so they have to, they, they are still people, um, good people, bad people, just like everyone else. And I would just, uh, we think we can say, oh, if we, if we make it like this, where, where, where we tell yeah. them what to do, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> then they're gonna do it just so. There's no oh. one single, There's no one single, but, but I, under, I understand the frustration, I understand the fear. You know, I have, uh, you know, I have uh, grown children in the world, I, yeah. I have the talk, I have, you know, I mean, I'm, 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 I understand that we should not fear the people that are supposed to keep us safe. And somewhere, um, and, if you, and if you think you gotta blow the system up and rebuild it from scratch, I understand that as well, um, but for now, I think that we really have to think about how we can make it really a partner mm -hmm. in safety because they're, they're, they're not, they respond mm -hmm. to things. They don't really prevent things, so. Uh, thank you, thank you so much, Robin, Simon, Andy. Uh, I'm sure that all of you would probably uh, like to jump into the conversation uh, right now. So we would like to just hold a little bit of time, maybe 10, 15 minutes to take questions. Uh, from the audience. I know we have a couple of uh, mic runners, so if you don't mind just raising your hand and then making sure you wait for the mic to reach you so that everybody can hear. Uh, maybe we can just give our panelists a warm round of applause before we... I have a question for Robin uh, with the police. My brother's a retired policeman and he served in Vietnam and then he served on the police department, which he said was more difficult than probably being in Vietnam with the racism within the department. So that's up on that. In terms of police being in schools, we had an officer friendly when I was in school. Do they still have that program where the officers come in with the coloring books and try to work with the children? So I'm not, I was not raised in Chicago. I came here as like a 20 something year old and I am amazed at the nostalgic affection for that dang officer friendly. Okay, so and to the point that so many people had mentioned it to the superintendent that yes, officer friendly is back. Okay. There are probably like 300 officers trained as officer friendly and I always say, you know, they're going to deal with it kindergarten, first, second graders. You know, they talk to the kids before their feet start stinking. And um, you know that's an easier that's an easier conversation, right? But yes, officer friendly is back. 
But I, al I also fear, you know, what happens if you get the idea that officers are friendly because of your experience with officer friendly, and then you, then you run up on one that's not? You, 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 that could cause some cognitive dissonance, I think, for and, our young people. I'm, I, I'm not saying that. Exposure. Right? Yeah. Right. But I, but, but I do think the idea that that you know that you could, that positive, authentic interactions outside of times of crisis, which is what I try to create space for, um, restorative justice means that we do have officers in circle with with young black and brown uh, people, youth and emerging adults, not just one time. And one, know, one and last question, I'm I don't want to harm. Uh, what is the educational level of these policemen? Have they had any sociology courses? What, what do they have to have? Listen, what's interesting is some people say we should get rid of the college uh, credit requirement, right? And I'm like, what well, do you want? Do you want them to come up? Do you want them to go down? What do you want, what do you want to happen? So it's, it's, they are required to have 60 credit hours post high school. They have to be 21. Yes, I'm recruiting. We will be opening up a test in a couple weeks. Um, they also, in the academy, they are trained in things like de-escalation. You know, you're not, you're not trained to be a sociologist. I think that would be a, someone told me if they wanted prison, prison to reform you, they would have, instead of guards, I'm sorry I'm doing this, but I really feel like I'm talking to people I can't see. Um, they would have uh, social workers instead of guards, right? Um, but no, they, they don't have a degree in sociology in order to be a police officer, but because of tuition reimbursement, <clears throat> another perk of the job, um, we have a lot of people that have degrees in uh, psychology, sociology, mm -hmm. uh, that tends to be what they gravitate toward. But there's, there's no additional training, right, for the specific officers that are in school? Yes, for the first time. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes, I could say, I could say that. I'm not, I, maybe it's not, as, uh, not what mm -hmm. I, it's going to be or what I think it should mm -hmm. be, but it has begun. We trained them in alternative responses, restorative justice. And as I said, it's kind of how they, how they're viewed, right? You have schools that have restorative practice. They have, they have peace rooms where their school officer has never been invited to, knows nothing about it. They kind of hold him in abeyance or her in abeyance like as a threat. Look, we can't settle this here. We're gonna call officer so-and-so using officers as a boogeyman, which is not helpful for the officer-friendly um, image. Thank you, Robin. Could you shall stand? Yeah. All right, as a qualifier to uh, Robin Robbins' uh, Colorado background, I was raised in Chicago, yes. But my question to the panel generally is, is it a CPD problem or is it a societal problem of which CPD is an apparatus there too? So anybody on the panel can address that. Yeah, who would like to address? I mean, I think it is a societal problem, clearly. We've, we've gutted our schools, our social su support systems, We've eliminated jobs, and we send in the police to clean up the mess. I mean, the police forces, you know, from the 19th century in Chicago was created as a tool of white industrial capitalists concerned about immigrant workers. Right? There you go. Before it was the tool, the people looking for their escaped property. And, and, and in Chicago, and don't forget the city grew up around Fort Dearborn, a, a settler colonial outpost for policing and removing the indigenous population, mm -hmm. right? The, the police, I mean, they're, they're a tool of the system. Uh, and, and, you know, the, the, the points that, that Simon made earlier about, about funding, about the relationship between policing and education and investment in our neighborhoods, those are the questions that we've got to address. I, yeah, I mean, and I would just, um, I mean, this is in some ways the cent one of the central questions of, of the book. Uh, and I think the answer is both, right? I mean, so on the one hand, I mean, and to, to Andy's point and to just reiterate what I said earlier, um, I mean, and I, think, and I think in large part to, to, to some of the points that Robin has made, um, you, know, you know, Chicago is a city, but America as a nation has, um, in a lot of ways, abdicated its responsibilities to huge sections of its population, right? Um, I, especially black and brown people, but, uh, but a number of other uh, communities as well. Um, and so when we think about this, uh, um, you know, what the function of policing is, um, you know, in a lot of ways, it is that we've created all these messes, and then really the only uh, institution that gets a ton of money at this point is the CPD to go essentially clean up these various messes. Um, so on the one hand, it is this social problem. On the other hand, um, 
I have no problem whatsoever saying that CPD has done a bad job with the responsibilities charged with it, right? I mean, that, that historically over time, I mean, that, you know, I mean, yes, the CPD is essentially charged with upholding a fundamentally unequal and racist social arrangement, um, but, they... <laughs> but also by the same token, within the confines of that mandate, there has been a long history of um, extraordinary and exceptional violence, of harassment, and of just completely unnecessary action that is tangential to that larger project, right? I mean, so I, I, my answer is that it's both, and I'm, I'm sure, that, I'm sure that, that my esteemed colleague disagrees. No, 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 and that's, that's why they have us here together, right? No, I, I, what I hear is they're doing a bad job at an impossible job, right? So that you could yeah. do this impossible job a little better. Um, because when, when, it, when you don't do it well, people's lives are at stake, right? right? right. So it's very important. I'm not saying that you know, they should not, it's, law enforcement should not be held to a standard beyond what everyone else is. Mm -hmm. Um, because it is a, you, have, you have the singular ability to, to do what no one else can do, which is to take one's, someone's freedom or their life, right? So that comes with an, an additional responsibility. Um, but I would, I would definitely, when you say is it a societal or a CPD problem, I just, I, I, looking at what's happening today and not being willing to look at the absolute root of these fruits, right, bitter as they are today, is, um, is, is, is because we don't want the pain of doing that. Why is it that all these other groups I named who are discriminated against, I have a letter from a superintendent back in the early uh, 20s talking about how they would never, the, the, the day they hire, a, and they use this word, a dago, would be the end of the department. They were that biased against Italians, right? So, but yet now, fast forward, you know, 100 years later, and um, everyone else has managed to move up. Right, the mobility, the lack of mobility, the persistent cyclical poverty, lack of generational wealth for African Americans, and I know it's more politically correct to say people of color, I'm talking about black people, is unique and um, something that we really need to address. Uh, it's not, you know, after two or three, you know, you can come here from someplace else and you're, you're in poverty for one generation and three generations later you can be Gold Coast all the way. I, I'm just saying, I'm just well, saying so. <laughs> I, I mean, and to, to this point too, I mean, I think it's worth thinking about the ways in which these larger, pro, I mean, these larger issues of race um, have fit within this story. I mean, that when you're talking about, you know, the, the discrimination against Italians, I mean, you know, back in the day, the CPD was an organization that was, uh -huh. that was wildly discriminatory against people, of, uh, against Irish people. And then the CPD becomes a jobs program for Irish people. Right? Nation, I mean, nationally, it's yeah. a very Irish system. I mean, like, I mean, I mean, most of the cops <laughs> in the twenties and thirties and forties are people from Bridgeport, um, and so. But it's you know, changing. It, it, but that, the I mean, demographic it, is changing. It, it, there's the the um, generational. Used to be, if your father was a cop, you were a yeah, cop. Your uncle yeah. was a cop, so and so, and yeah. you have basically Caucasian officers telling their young people, "Don't go into this." Field. It's no one appreciates you. You're under all this scrutiny. It's psychologically difficult. I mean, you have now information that you we, that wasn't previously shared about the the rates of suicide, drug abuse, domestic violence among members of law enforcement, um, because as I said, there's been no attention to to trauma. Just like we have not treated what's happening in our communities as a public health problem, right? And the trauma creating more trauma. Um, so it's it's what's what's growing. Um, there are a lot of Hispanics are um, mm -hmm. coming on the job. Um, so if you, anybody has, uh, has some ways that you can help me to recruit African Americans, to, I see one of my partners there who helps, who tries to help us. Um, you know, and, and, and the, the tagline, talk about acknowledging uh, you know, how bad you've been, the tagline is be the change mm -hmm. for our recruitment. Um, you know, I mean, there, no one is trying to say that there's not it's not even reform, but like I say, it's transform is what's needed. Um, and the lessons from this history, you know, ought to caution us, right? Even as, as the demographics right. change, that ma making sure that this system just doesn't come that's even right. exactly and uh, repeats itself uh, and over and over. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. I think we have time for the final question. And I'm going to choose this gentleman over here, if you don't mind bringing the microphone. So going back to the question of the 74 officers or people on their CPD payroll that are in these schools, 
Um, when 72 you, schools, more than 72 officers, because there's two officers assigned to each one, and then you, yeah. Okay. okay, even more officers than I thought. They're all high schools. Um, okay, so I, um, I guess one of the, my immediate question after you brought up that um, was not necessarily why some of these officers are called. Um, I was a product of CPS. I've seen officers since I was in middle school roaming around oh. schools, inside of schools, and I was a product all the way through high school. I've seen them in high schools. But what you said was really uh, fascinating because you brought up that they were asked to be there. People called them. Um, and I guess this gets to a really important question on, again, something Simon brought up, about who is calling the police into these community uh, systems, into these community spaces. Because what we see in some, some of the things that we talked about is that sometimes well-intentioned um, requests for the police end up having detrimental effects, right? Yes. The, the perimeter around the Black Belt in the 19, right. uh, 1919, policing in the uh, 1990s and early 2000s that moved into um, data gathering. These are all things that might have had good intentions but ended up having detrimental effects. And when we talk about restorative justice, we think about, well, it's supposed to be about restoring the community's power over them. But, you know, it being the title of your job or having um, oh. some of your, uh, being the description of your job, in what ways is the CPD making serious efforts to address this question of who is calling the police? And who is calling the police into spaces like schools? And why is the police not moving away? Why is the police not making an effort to say, maybe someone else, maybe we should have someone else in the community be the one requesting our help, other than maybe, I don't know, be the principals ones who's that are request. from outside mm -hmm. the community, people that are not trained to deal or de-escalate themselves, a request that we know CTU is kind of making along with other people in the... So being trained to de-escalate, being trained in advancing youth development, being trained in, in alternative uh, responses um, is all part of what you like to have. If you have to have officers in your school, they should be... I mean, we went to schools where the officers had been there for the last 12, 14 years, where the stu we talked to students by themselves who talked about how these officers were their go-to when other adults in the building, in the, in the school system, you know, were, were, were not giving them justice. These, these officers helped them with science projects, came to their games. They felt like part of the caring adult community, but they had the advantage of also being protective if something happened, right? Um, that was the ideal. You know, conversely, you know, you have people who say, we don't, if you don't want officers in your schools, the people that, that ask for it are the school community. So the local school council in, in, in consultation with the principal, which remember is hired and fired by the local school council. Um, oftentimes it's, you know, teachers feel unsafe in many of these schools uh, because these students are coming to school with a whole lot of baggage. Uh, and those schools that have, have found ways besides being punitive to address that um, I'm thinking of one school on the north side, Sullivan High School, they had 700 suspensions three years ago. They only have a, like 750 students. Okay, so I'm like, everybody gets suspended. Um, they were calling, they had, you know, like 12 arrests. They had this, last year they had, I think they said 20 suspensions and only one arrest, and that was because the police came looking for a student who had done something, something else, but they, someplace else, but they knew they'd be in school, right? So changing that school climate, um, it becomes, so that you feel like, you, so you're, Principal and local school council say well, we don't think we need officers inside the school anymore, right? We don't. We, we think we're we think we're good. Yeah. Um, you, you can look at CPS touts some numbers that some people argue about um, about the number of students. Remember the school to prison pipeline? Um, they have some data that seems to indicate that's drastically been reduced um, because that was uh, that was a crime against humanity. Uh, but we talk about all these other things that aren't working, whether it's your your your, your economic uh, path, your educational path, your wellness, mental health path, but the, the only representation of all these failed systems that shows up in person in your community are the police officers. So that's where a lot of, your, of the frustration is aimed, right? It's, as I said, low-hanging fruit. Um, so they're there in person. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that that's, that kind of, kind of causes us to look at that, and it's a little easier to look at than all the, and less complex it seems, right? If we just stop, stop those cops from doing that, right, everything would be better. Yeah. But if you gotta start looking at complicated socioeconomic, uh, you know, racial history, 
then, then how are we going to fix it, right? Yeah. If I can just fix that cop, I can fix this problem at least is, is what I think happens. Am I wrong, you think? I think it just raises a larger philosophical question, which is what it means that so many of our young people, their understanding, like their only, their primary interactions with agents of the state or agents of the government are police. Yeah. Right? I mean, and so what, I mean, so when we think about that, I mean, I don't know how many people in the room live right around, um, you know, live in, in River North, live in Gold Coast. Um, my suspicion is that if you do, you don't have many interactions with the police. Um, and so I think it's worth thinking about what it is like and what it means philosophically for the experiences of so many of, of our young people to be defined by, to have their understanding of who the, you know, who the government is, who, who supposedly these representatives of a, dem, of a democratic society are, that their primary lens through understanding their relationship to this larger great project of democracy is police. Um, Personally, I, I, I think that's a problem. Um, again, that is not to say that that's the fault of the police. Um, I mean, to the gentleman's mm -hmm. point earlier, I mean, that this is, again, part of this larger reality of police being tasked with doing a very, very sort of impossible job of navigating and enforcing the status quo in a, in a profoundly unequal society. Um, but I do think that there are these larger, I mean, these, there's a lot of larger philosophical questions here um, mm -hmm. to be had about, you know, what exactly all of this means for us living in a supposedly democratic society um, and having these be the realities that shape people's lives. Thank you for that wonderful question um, because I think it does remind us that we have the opportunity to have these discussions and these conversations with the people who are experiencing uh, these, these um, everyday interactions as well, and to sort of break from moderator hat for, for a second, you know, as a, also a product of Chicago Public Schools, um, you know, some of us can speak personally to, to, to that experience, and it definitely, as even the, the note that um, I sort of started with, it just kind of seeps into your subconscious, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Something that you kind of just carry with you. What if those um, interactions were? That. What if those interactions were positive? Yeah. I mean, if you're having a lot of interactions with the police, I'm, I'm assuming you mean like a lot of bad things. Or just, I mean, or philosophically, what it means for, for, for that to be how people understand their relationship to this larger democratic project. I mean that. I mean that if you're only. I mean that if you're, you know, if you're a 16 year old kid, um, whose understanding of your relationship to the state or the government, you know, I mean, this, by which I mean the city government or the larger state government, the national government, if, if the police are your primary understandings of what that is, I mean, I guess maybe if you have these wonderfully amazing interactions with police, then maybe that looks, um, maybe that is may perhaps not like a bad perception of your relationship to your, to your country. Um, but but by, the, by the same token, there is, um, I, I think that for the most part, that's not necessarily the case. But who are the, the people who, who are not interacting with police as a representative of the structure within which we live? Who are, who are their interactions with? How, who do they see as representative of the state? I mean, that can be any, I mean, I mean it can be the larger sort of schools when the schools are actually placed in, fun, you know, our schools are given robust funding and treated as places of care. The great like, schools, the Whitney Youngs, yeah, the. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I mean, but it can, yeah, I mean, it can be, I mean, all the things that we, you know, I mean, just, you know, participating in, in democratic processes and so on and so forth. I mean, that I just, I, and again, I, don't, I mean, because these are larger philosophical questions that I know yeah. we're out of time to, yeah. to do. I was to, just going to say, I yeah. hate to cut us off yeah, yeah, here, yeah. but. Um, but it's, it's a great, no, it's, I mean, it's a, it's a good question. It's a good and question. it's, a, it's it a really a good segue for us um, to just continue the conversations and perhaps even in smaller groups, as I had mentioned uh, briefly earlier, we do encourage um, all of you to engage with our panelists, with each other. Um, once you exit the theater, there will be several conversation stations uh, for us to continue these conversations, and our panelists will be able to uh, join them, um, join the conversations as well. And we have a small reception, so those of you who are old enough, you can grab a beer, or a glass of wine, a snack, uh, and we can continue that conversation a little further. People, right? uh, but once again, thank you so much. Uh, you were a wonderful audience. You thank were, you, for our you were a wonderful audience. Thank you.